Hello, this is Cuckoo. In today's episode of the mini series, where I'm creating a whole new uh, live set on the electronic devices that I have, um, in today's episode, I'm going to take you through a lot of uh, samplers and beat machines. Like this is a sampler, for instance. This has been my main sampler for a whole uh, a couple of years now. Um, very, very powerful. I call this, in my own words, a performance machine, a performance monster, which is, it's been very reliable and powerful. Uh, another one, uh, which I call more of an instrument, a sample instrument, is the Digitact, Octatrack Digitact. This is simpler uh, and has a totally different vibe to it, I'd say. And I want to create music on this. Uh, now, so I'm going to scrap the Octatrack for this gig and, and create more and more stuff on the Digitac. Yeah, in the video I'm going to show you a lot of stuff on this and also I'm going to give you a little insight in how my uh, previous gig was uh, structured. Uh, yeah, and this is also a sampler, <laughs> pocket operator style. These are really cool because you can walk away from, um, yeah, uh, and you can bring the music with you in, in your hand and the buttons are very sticky so yeah yeah so there's really cool because you you can do you can rap when you're doing the beats like this and be a rapper with a mic stand yeah it's really cool so some of this, I guess, I'm going to go through. Also this, which is a, a massive beat machine and a sample machine as well. Uh, yeah, this is extremely powerful with the analog engines. And it's also got synth engines in there, not just drum engines, but tonal stuff. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go through a lot of these machines uh, and also touch upon the... The, the workflow that I see uh, that works for me when I'm uh, recording stuff onto these machines and making samples, producing samples. Um, I tend to do it through a computer uh, because I have more control of, of the mix, how I want the sounds to sound together. Uh, and also there's like precise EQ and compression and yeah, to, to really produce the sounds rather than just record them straight onto the machine. Uh, one of the devices that I frequently use for uh, uh, shaping the sounds further is this analog heat. This is a, a really powerful sound shaper, I'd say, where you can create different kinds of distortions uh, in stereo and uh, yeah, there's a little EQ and bass there. Very, very interesting for creating various levels of wackiness I'd say also subtle levels of wackiness or just subtle levels of niceness <laughs> um, yeah anyhow yeah let's take a look at all of this and uh, yeah I want you in this series to to borrow my mind for a bit so you can go through this together with me and uh, I'm gonna try to be as as open as possible about uh, my choices and about how I look at the different things and also in the end I'm gonna be really strict with myself and say no to a lot of stuff in order to to make room for creativity because I, I think once I've locked and sealed the the live uh, rig that's when I can really start to make music um, for that specific rig yeah yeah something like that so okay Let's get going. Okay, so these are the notes from the previous episode. Some notes on synthesizers that I'm likely to select. And yeah, yeah, so new page, new possibilities. Samplers and, and beat makers. Beaters, <laughs> that's horrible. No, you know, I didn't like that. Let's just pick a machine uh, and I'll start with the Octatrack and I'll show you a bit of what I've done in the past. Uh, yeah, let's start from there. Yeah, here we go. Damn. Just, okay, so let's have a look at what I've done previously with the Octatrack. 
and why I like it so much. This is a robust solution for stage use and I feel very secure and nothing goes horribly wrong when I use it this way. So let's just have a listen uh, at some of the songs here. So, um, doesn't matter when, doesn't matter why, all I think about is you. Hollow as a ghost, I am there's a dead or it is, does it? Yeah, it's you, like, I will. Doesn't matter who, I got by my side, all I think about is making me a traitor, a liar in the shallow, a flash in the roller, it's the old thing, give me a Be with you, wanna be with you, wanna be with you, wanna be with you, wanna be with you. Wanna be with you. Wanna be with you, you, you. Wanna be with you. Wanna be with you. Wanna, wanna be with you. 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 Wanna be with
just a whole recording of a track. So in this case, I've been lazy and I've just taken that whole track from the computer and put it right in here. And then I've, um, let's go to slices. I made four slices for different parts of the songs. And this will scale with the tempo. And you can hear the time stretching going on, but it's not that bad, so uh, I'm, I'm using time stretching sometimes. So, track six. Doesn't matter when. Be with, be with you. Doesn't Try to keep vocals as, as late as possible in the track count. In this case, it wasn't track six. Be with doesn't matter when, doesn't matter why, all I think. In this case, uh, by chopping up the vocals like this, doesn't matter when, doesn't matter who, be with you, doesn't matter when, you can see this whole slice why, here. All I think about is you, hollow as a ghost, and I empty as a dead old tree, that's me. So, a whole phrase there is just recorded straight and played back straight. So, uh, I haven't done anything. Um, miraculously special about it. I've just been a bit lazy, frankly. Uh, but for this song, I, I thought it was a, yeah, it suited this song. But later on, into this this part here. That's where it gets interesting, I think, uh, because now I'm I'm truly rearranging the song in a way that it's more uh, like, like suitable to do on, on a sampler like the octave track. Like what I've done here with the whole sampler is I've sliced it up into different slices and each slice is now represented here on the keyboard. If I press function here and press down or up, I can toggle between different keyboards. I quickly go between slices and, and delay control. These are my two Go to mode. Delay controls is for uh, making uh, beat repeats and stuff like that. And slices is for uh, reaching into the samples and play those slices on the keyboard. What I can do while this is playing is, in my case, I've, I've uh, let's go down to the delay control here. And on track six, track six. What happens if I fire off the delay control on track six while, while this is playing? I'm freezing like that. Yeah, so that's something I could do. Now it's only happening on that track. So well, everything is on now. I think that's pretty cool. And with the slider here, with the scene slider, I can quickly just okay load up scene 14 onto the B, uh, B destination. S then it sounds like this. I'm just gonna see if it's. <laughs> That's kind of crazy, like a vibrato there. What, what about scene 15? No. How about... So I'm going... I'm slowing down the tempo and then going into reverse. That's pretty cool. Let's hear it with the other tracks. I think this is really cool to rig it like this. And it's not this part, like setting up scenes and stuff, it, it's not difficult to set up at all. If you've come this far and that you have all oh, these sequences going, um, you just press B, uh, 
this is empty let's do this and then while holding it wiggle the control so for instance if we'd like to do like that we could do hold down this wiggle this and it's good to go okay let's pick another song one thing that bugs me a bit with the with the octa track which i've been embracing with open arms on the dig attack is that on the dig attack you can store the bpm per uh, per pattern i wish they had that on the octa track as well because in the live situation uh, when i'm going from one song to another uh, the bpm is uh, it's it's manual basically so the only way to set the tempo in the octa track is either to to make an arrangement uh, but i don't use arrangements because i'm doing it live uh, or to set it manually so what i've done is to <laughs> write the set list and write the bpm on the on the note which is a bit old school uh, but you can also do this if if you listen to this song now i miss you this song has some tracks that are basically recorded like that track is recorded we go to that track go to the audio editor go to file attributes we can see that uh, this temp this uh, audio file is recorded in 128 bpms this can be wrong and you can also set it manually in the files uh, but this is an indication of what the tempo should be. So sometimes when I've lost the notes or something, or lost my memory on stage or something, <laughs> uh, I go into this audio editor and check the BPM here. This is not very cool. Uh, but I'm doing that and then I'm quickly uh, setting the tempo. Yeah. Let's check out uh, another song because I want to show you what another really fun feature on the octa track probably this one again it's running too fast i'm going to check the tempo audio editor on another track and we see the tempo there 111 i'm going to set the tempo as you can see this could drive you nuts with some of the songs like this song you might have seen me uh, play solo, like synth solos on the octa track. That's totally, totally possible. So in this song, let's see. That solo there it is not a whole recording. I've actually done a scale that I want to use in this song and I think it works really well. So in this case, I could play over this. Yeah. Yeah. And since I've also recorded a sort of melodic solo there, I can let go of it and uh, it, it won't stop completely. Yeah, I really enjoy this. I, I uh, do. Yeah. So what do I enjoy with this? I mean, it's a sample. You can also do all sorts of stuff with live sampling and live looping and stuff. And the beat, I mean, set, up, set it up to sync to... Uh, an ex uh, external source and and then sample stuff on the fly in the perfect uh, bar and stuff yeah there's a lot of stuff you could do with it so let's make a little 
Note to, shall we? Okay, off to track. What do you like about it? I like it's a memory card. Everything is on the memory card. Memory card. And when you're traveling, you know that all the data is right here. Uh, I usually have two cards, just I know that this is going to be a backup, it's exactly the same, just pop it into a card reader on the computer and, and boom, it's it's just there, you know. This this is very good. I, in a way, I wish that all machines were like that, so, so the backup was really, really simple. This is a 64 gigabyte card. Uh, you can do really long samples if you want to. Samples. Stereo, which is nice. This whole scene slider thing is brilliant. I think it works so well, it's very fast. Scenes. Yeah, do you know what I'm gonna write it? Power. I'm gonna, it's like a powerhouse. One minus could be uh, that it's hard to get into, but once you're into it, you know it. So then it's not difficult anymore. Uh, and I'm into it now, so it's, it's not a, an issue anymore. Um, so that's more about uh, if you're a beginner, uh, it's going to take a while before you get into it. But there is something uh, regarding the, the feeling of the machine. I'm, I refer to the Octatrack as a performance machine and the Digitact as an instrument. And I still, in some way, think that is true, for me at least. When I'm... With the Octatrack, I, th I think about arranging the songs more than composing the songs. And that might just be a personal preference, but that's how I feel about it. So I have less an instrument. It it's really personal, this, um, because I, I really enjoy it. But this is one of the key features why I decided to go with something completely different and much more simple, uh, like the Digitact. Yeah. So next up, uh, let's take a look at the Digitact, shall we? You see. Okay. <laughs> Just by previewing that little song, you can see on my face I'm like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm smiling. I didn't smile with the Octatrack. Uh, to be honest, I didn't smile. I, I feel like that is like a workhorse, serious stuff. Uh, but I, I didn't really smile. And I didn't feel like, yeah, I'm going to show you how to make a little uh, uh, piece of music. I feel like, well, if I'm going to make some music on that, I'd rather prepare stuff and uh, carefully pick my samples. And uh, yeah, even though you can do almost exactly the same music on the Octatrack that you can on the Digitact if you really want to, you can. But it's a different mood, different feeling. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit weird. <laughs> but just by hearing this. <laughs> this music is created on the Digitact, specifically for the Digitact, uh, composed for this machine, on this machine, uh, by me. <laughs> Let's check out some other... Yeah. This machine inspires me to create this kind of music. With the Octatrack, 
Um, I, I never quite made music that I felt was deeply inspired by, by the machine. Some of the songs, yes, but, but on the Dig Attack, almost everything I do is inspired by this machine. It's like if you have a guitar and you play the guitar really well, you're heavily into guitars. And uh, it, it's not like it's going to sound like a violin sound suddenly. And I f feel with the dig attack, I'm like, yes, yes, this, uh, this really inspires me and it gives me ideas. So I borrow uh, like some magic of the machine and it transfers into the music. It's like a Japanese anime magical moment. It's like, Teo Kastagura, hi. Yeah. <laughs> And I actually like playing the keyboard. Yeah, so that's entirely possible. So as with the with the octa track, I'm creating some sort of common structure here. There are some suggestions here, like kick, snare, tone, clap, cowbell, closed hi hat, open hi hat, cymbal. I don't really like these uh, names, so uh, um, kick is probably the only one I've kept too. <laughs> Maybe the snare as well. Sometimes I have the snare here, but. Um, so let's have a listen to this song for instance. That's a jolly little tune, isn't it? So let's see how I've structured that, that little pattern. As you can see, when I'm moving around it, take a look at the BPM of that. Pattern one, 140. Pattern three, 140. Pattern, f well, everything is in 140. It's tenko. Uh, 12, 138, 138, yeah. 124, yeah. So, the this is an option you can turn it off if you want to global temp bpm or uh, a local bpm per pattern i like to keep it per pattern because then i know that whenever i play that pattern it's going to be as it was intended i can quickly and carelessly move around um, okay so with this uh, this little Okay, so let's see how I structure this. Okay, kick counts as a snare, I guess. So hi hat, clap. This um, I don't think I've used it. Maybe you intend to use it. Some sort of bleep. Yeah. So this is usually the, the layout. Sometimes I keep chords on number eight and the lead on seven. So I switched it here for some reason. A really useful addition in the latest firmware is that uh, on the master, function and master, there are two master pages now. One is uh, the usual levels. The other one is a compressor, like a master compressor. This is insanely useful. To, to to make everything uh, stay within the same levels and people often use the, the term to glue it together to glue the mix together which basically means that if the mix is a bit spacious and uh, perhaps a bit uneven uh, using a compressor it's gonna uh, yeah compress it basically and make it stand out a bit more, make it a bit more punchy. So with this song, if I turn off the compressor, just raise the volume. Uh, 
That's pretty nice actually. You can feel like it's easier on the ears and it, it's perhaps uh, uh, a bit more sparse or something. But when I turn on the compressor, the dynamics and the uh, the instruments they kind of close in on each other a bit, so it's it's becoming a, like this one little expression rather than uh, than separate tracks. So I, I think because there are so few tracks, like eight tracks, it's not a whole deal of tracks. Uh, the compressor is really helping to to glue it together to mold it into one uh, expression. So that was a really nice addition. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna just create something new and see how I go about to create something. So this is clear. Okay, I'm gonna start by selecting a um, kick. Now these are sounds that I've already loaded into it. Perhaps this, I'm gonna bit crush it. Maybe overdrive, make it shorter. Okay, tune it. Yeah, maybe that. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna make a little uh, metronome. So what about the tempo? I'm gonna go with the keyboard, I'm gonna turn the keyboard on. I'm gonna make it two pages long, record. One, two, three, and. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna tune it down a bit. Okay, gonna have some sort of uh, stick, like rim shot. I'm gonna go to these from uh, Native Instruments here. A sample. Okay. I'm gonna sequence it manually. Yeah, that's gonna go. Yeah, and then I'm gonna make some sort of snare. I immediately changed my mind. Okay, I'm gonna copy this sound. Uh, track, copy sound to this, because this is where I usually keep the tonal stuff, rhythms. Actually, I usually do like four rhythmical channels and four tonal channels, four, four. It's uh, usually enough. So paste the sound there. This needs some spice. And some reverb. Maybe I'm gonna thin and make it thinner. Change the reverb to make it before the compressor. So I want this tone here. Yeah. Okay, I'll turn off the metronome now. It's fun, it's fun. Okay, I'm gonna turn on the keyboard now. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I like 
this. I'm gonna make a like a a little vibrato on just that one. I'm gonna rig the LFO to do the tuning, and then on this one, I'm gonna do a little experiment. I'm gonna do a hi hat, which oops, wrong channel source hi hat. Uh, I'm gonna keep to that ebony thing here. This one, yeah. Okay, so how do I sequence that in an interesting way? Yeah, maybe copy these pages. And now in this um, in this document, I've already loaded some uh, different some different sounds in the pool, so I could so I could change this one, for instance, and reach into the pool and say, yeah, that should be a hat too. I'm gonna create a bass. Dum, dum. I'm gonna retune to be in line with the little bleep there. So one semitone down. Okay, maybe some bit reduction to tackle this fullness of this bass. Maybe some filter. So yeah, record that. One, two, three. Now it's time to to create that snare drum or a clap. I don't know. So this sounds pretty nice. I'm going to copy this pattern, go to a different pattern, paste it there. Uh, another thing that I really like here is you can paste the head. While it's playing, I can press pattern, destination, and then paste pattern and keep it. To paste the head is very, very useful. So far I'm in control and it sounds cool, but I'm totally in control. But now I'm going to borrow some power, the dig attack, and what makes it so fun to compose on it. Because now I'm going to control all parameters and all pages and see if I can uh, come up with some unexpected results, basically. Okay, so I'm going to keep this. I'm going to tune the whole thing. I'm gonna go to the compressor. Yeah. A bit heavy, perhaps. was borrowing some of the power of this machine to come up with a, a more fun idea than what I had originally. So by reaching into everything at once and doing something 
that I'm not entirely sure of uh, the outcome of. Um, I'm kind of living alongside where the dig is tacked in a, in a way that I really like. So this... Yeah, perhaps now I'd go back to the kick and say, yeah, you know, that kick maybe should be a bit longer after all. So I'm gonna create like a kick here. Also, there is this fill uh, functionality. I can create uh, a different set of, of tricks that is only active when I press this. So that is something I really dig. So I'm gonna do that on the hi-hat. So this is already kind of full, but how about, yeah, this trig and fill. Copy, 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 copy. Yeah, okay, yeah, it works. I'm gonna create fill hi-hat on every note, like that, okay. Yeah, how about some LFO on the volume? Perhaps the, the kick drum should, uh, it was part of the transposing now. So the kick drum also was a bit high. Uh, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take the kick drum lower again. But before I change it, I'm gonna copy the parameter page and uh, just in case I miss, mess up. Perhaps it's just this repeated, that should be a bit lower. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. I think this is really interesting. Uh, I, I came from this. I thought this was pretty cool. But listening to it now, it feels really stale and simple. And listen to what happened when I started to go over it and not being afraid of, of keeping the original idea because I, I don't think original ideas is precious unless it's amazing and uh, I didn't feel like it was amazing and now I changed it into this and now I think it's it, it rocks <laughs> like I've got this this is a beat squeezer and I especially asked him the maker of this it's this is a side project for him so don't be too mean to him if he doesn't have enough units but I asked him before I make this video if he's gonna make more of them. And he said, yeah, I'm making a more batch, but be patient, it's taking a, a bit of time. It's his side project. But this is a super, super useful um, sample instrument. I could sample a whole keyboard, one sample per note, uh, or th actually three samples per note if I want to, to have layers. And this is something that I could connect here and sequence. So whenever I feel like, oh, I actually need a, a piano chord here or something, you know, bring something portable like this, that, like a smaller synth. I also got this. This is the Pile Square, which is one of the smallest synthesizers in the world with an enclosure. And it's power, powered by MIDI. So this is a synth that I, I can just plug it in here and it'll, it'll be powered. 
and then I could send the audio out. This is really cool, a bit wacky synth with some different firmwares, one with a speech synthesizer was really wacky, and some analog digital sounds. Uh, so this could also be like a, a really small, helpful uh, little device. For instance, for a bass or a simple, uh, it's like duophonic, so you can, you can make like almost a little chord there. Yeah, this is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I totally like it. As you can see, when, when I create music with this, uh, I get inspiration, and when I get inspired, I create yeah, more and more stuff, and, uh, and then it becomes really cool. So, yeah, the dig attack, I like it. <laughs> so, yeah, let's make some notes on the dig attack, shall we? Now, if I compare it to the Octatrack and make like a specification list, I could put up a lot of negatives here. I could say like memory card backup. No, there is no backup. Uh, there is overbridge, but to make a complete backup, it's a pain. Uh, long samples, no, you can't. There's a limited memory stuff like that. You can you could do that, and then it wouldn't look so good on paper. But I'm gonna do this. Plus, smile factor. Smile. This is a smile machine for me. I'm smiling when I'm using this. And I'm borrowing its power. Um, and I think musically it's empowering me for some reason. Yeah. Delightful. <laughs> yeah, for some reason I, I think the sound is better than it should be on paper. Um, it's just playing back samples. And you have some filters and stuff, but every time I create music with it, it's like, wow, it actually sounds really, really good. I don't know why. For live use, I think uh, using this as a keyboard is totally feasible. But you can totally, you know, put a, a, a normal keyboard in there and play it like that if you want to. Uh, the MIDI sequencer, well, this has a MIDI sequencer too, MIDI. I feel like if I want to, I could, I could say like, no, I'm just gonna play on the dig attack, and that's gonna be fine. And for the most part, I think that's what I'm gonna do. But I also want some of the smaller instruments as well. Um, but how do we get the samples in here, and where do they come from? I told you earlier that I'm not gonna live sample, I'm not going to sample on the actual unit, I'm going to sample with, uh, with a computer uh, because uh, I believe that I can get a higher quality that way uh, with some post-production or pre-sample mix post pre-production. <laughs> I think uh, this works in, in a lot of way very similarly to the DigiTact and because of that I also get a lot of inspiration. I'd say that this is one of Electron's most powerful synthesizers. Uh, you got 12 tracks with a sequencer on every track. They're sharing eight channels like uh, everything with a chain between them. They're sharing the same channel. Uh, so, uh, and so yeah, eight voices analog synth with some very specific engines. When I'm creating sound packs, I'm using this a lot and making like, okay, let's go to, uh, and then we've got some really nice overdrive in there. But what I'm doing when I'm uh, creating sounds, like, I'm actually using the analog heat a lot to uh, to run the sounds through the analog heat and create uh, variations of sounds. Let's try that. Where where to put it? Let's say this is the snare drum. I want to try to do stuff with. I turn off the reverb. Generally, reverb through the heat doesn't always transfer that well. So I generally turn it off. Okay, let's see. So, clean boost, wet level, drive. Okay, saturation. 
enhancement crazy mid drive wow low frequency and then I, I record different constellations of of stuff that on off so this is like the high f high fidelity sound and with the uh, analog heat kind of more uh, pronounced okay rough crunch it's crazy how about this it breathes some air in like <laughs> with that just very deep uh, and some systems you probably can't even hear it because of the sub the subwoofer quality of the sound but then here we add so much texture and stuff yeah and also I kind of compress it here as well a lot of times so I let the envelope uh, either be a noise gate in this case or uh, the opposite I could compress it as well so right now it's actually adding uh, when it's it's like an expander <laughs> and how about classic distortion uh, round fuzz Ooh. it's really this is always like a, a like a wild card will it work if it does it's going to be amazing if it doesn't it's going to be a bit strange like on this i'm not sure if it works but on the bass there yeah amazing amazing that so this is what i do i just sit and fiddle and fiddle and fiddle fiddle like the heck out of all the sounds i record them in, in the computer and then i try to to sort them out usually it's like thousands of hits of sounds and then i'm trying to sort them out like this is good for casual kick drums this is good for casual uh snares this is good for something really uh, pronounce and heavy stuff and try to sort it all out and so going down from 2000 hits to maybe something like 200 and then um, I'm starting to try to post uh, process everything yeah okay let's do that let's okay I'm gonna show you the process of how I prepare samples that I want to use on sample players okay let's do it Usually for this, I'm gonna record snippets. So I don't want any pre-roll here. So I'm gonna set the counting to zero, no counting. It's gonna go. So I'm gonna press record here. Ooh, the round first. And I'm gonna change. Sometimes it sounds good with the bass. And sometimes you regret it afterwards. Okay, so let's make it shorter. Gonna go in here. Uh, ooh. There is a sample there as well. I usually don't record this much per I, I usually try fit around a bit and I feel like I'm finding a sweet spot and I'm like yeah this is good this is good so this now we have a lot of, too many of them and I'm usually doing like control X uh, to to automatically cut and chop it up like that it's sometimes a, a good help sometimes it's uh, uh, it's not as good a feature as you would like for instance 
if we zoom in here we can see that oh it's actually cutting it way too early so there's a lot of manual uh, fiddling uh, before you're uh, happy with it with the edit so that's a uh, more or less yeah what I'm doing is I'm keeping some colors here to uh, to kind of find the the ones that I like that's nice it's like a deep brown base that's more or less the same that's nice too a bit differently colored and I'm gonna skip those yeah these are basic and cool this is kind of thin, so, something there, like a little bleak maybe, but kind of cool. That was nice, a bit too much. So basically I'm going through all the samples like this. Oh wow, that was massive. And make, make some sort of a coloring system. Usually I do pink is a keeper the ones that stand out as really really good no question about it. i'm gonna keep that and uh yeah that's like the only color code right now sometimes i do color like more based on the sound quality but pink for me it's like the keeper Ooh, yeah these are pinkies and as you can hear on this the ending there is like a really harsh ending there click it clicks in the end uh, so that needs to be taken care of fade fade out like a really a subtle fade out maybe I'll fix it and before I I um, export them I also make sure that I'm absolutely cutting them uh, exactly where they should be cut and I'm a frequent user of fab filter. I'm using sometimes the multiband compressor, sometimes just the compressor, uh, but definitely the the equalizer, which I think is really helpful, and uh, and this, yeah, these two. I'm a frequent user on both of these, so uh, an active limiter and a really great EQ. It's beefy, yeah, we can see that. I'm not a professional mixing engineer by any means, but uh, I know that if you're gonna make a really good kick drum and have that play really well in relation to other sounds, then maybe it shouldn't cover all the sp spectrums like in this shot here. Maybe it's a bit too much. Um, so maybe I should start and I run out some some frequencies that maybe will typically interfere interfere with vocals and stuff and be a bit uh, smart about it. And sometimes even. Uh, this is a kick, but it sounds also like a powerful snare. If I want to normalize this sound, I can normalize this when I export, but I can also compress it with this active limiter. Uh. You can see it's working heavily here. And also, if you tend to hear it clipping and snapping and distorting a bit, uh, you can turn on the advanced features here. You can turn on some look ahead to make it look ahead a bit and make the limiter act uh, a bit earlier to predict the sound levels. As you can see down, you know, on the volume here. It's, this is a massive recording, 
but sometimes you actually need stuff like that normalized sounds that are uh, really loud uh, because when you load it up into a sampler, most samplers, this is the way that samplers expect the sounds to be. Like for the Novation Circuit, I made a whole sound pack with just uh, sounds from the pocket operators. And when I first loaded in there, uh, I couldn't get them loud enough uh, because the way I exported it was not loud enough. And uh, so it's it's really necessary a lot of times to export everything normalized or even uh, pushed uh, a bit too high to make it play in the same volume as uh, the rest of the stuff on, on the sampler. Uh, for me, I think maybe it's a bit like a loudness war also going on on samplers. Uh, I think it would be nice to have a little headroom there, like a bit more dynamic sounds maybe. Uh, but yeah, if you only use your own sounds, uh, it's going to be easy to to select what level you want to export it. Yeah, so so this is a process that I'm, I'm doing a lot of. Um, and then in the end, I end up with something like 200 sounds or something. And I just upload it to the beat machine. Yeah, let's upload something to the Digitac, shall we? Uh, the audio fuse is actually um, a USB hub as well. There you go. Okay. So I'll take away this. Okay, so now we've got three. Oops, three, three. And let's listen. To yeah, that's good. Three. Three is like a magic number for me when it comes to exporting a palette of sounds like aggressive, medium and light. Sometimes you need to get, expand a bit like having five or six levels of intensity but three is often like a really good, not too many, not too few. So I often end up exporting three different levels of intensity of sounds. Okay, I'm going to export this as audio files. It's going to take all of them and make them individual files. So, kicker, I guess. Export. There we go. Let's see. Massive. Massive. Okay, so there we go. I'm going to open transfer. Uh, there we go. It says there is a dig attack here with firmware 1.0. Oh, eight uh, folders device folder uh, if I don't want want it to be here I could just uh, type a new folder so I'm gonna call this demo kicks because I'm I want to find okay and then it's just uh, you know good old-fashioned uh, drag-and-drop dish so there it go and yeah, it should be on the dig tab. So let's see, I'm gonna go in here, I'm going to samples, it's gonna be a new folder called demo kicks. Just created it, there we go. Massive. As you might know, the dig attack is in mono, so it's handling all the files in mono, although you can pan and the stereo reverb and delay, it's in stereo, but the files has mysteriously somewhere been converted to a format that uh, this machine supports and uh, I'm actually not sure if it's the dig attack that does it or if it's transfer that does it mm, yeah I don't know we didn't write anything for the analog rhythm powerful analog sounds many tracks if you want to travel lightly I feel like it's a tad big so I'm gonna type it as a negative here size uh, diverse yeah and the samples as well analog heat um, yeah the way I want to use it yeah let's type it down here heat the way I tend to use the heat is in sound production so I'm gonna put it down here sound uh, so I'm gonna make use of it when I'm creating samples and making a library of 
different sounds with different amount of kind of aggress aggressive push into the sounds. Um, also, I find it very interesting to use to create lush variations and to add texture to sounds. I'm gonna put that down, texture. To use it live, I've done it a few times and it's good, but in my kind of world now, it's gonna be pretty digitally um, controlled sounds in samplers. And to apply an analog uh, domain after this digital domain, uh, sometimes I feel like you're trying to hide the digitalness of the samplers, uh, which I, I actually kind of like this glitchy digital domain. So I'm not afraid of uh, of showing that. I, actually, I think it's cool. So applying some analog uh, beefy filters and saturation and stuff, I think actually sometimes uh, can take away from the source rather than introduce to the source and so using the analog heat on the master for instance is um, um, something i'm very careful about uh, as a compressor yeah as a filter uh, yeah i'm very careful about it uh, i'm just going to use it if i think it really adds something like an instrument uh, if not um, no, not in the kind of music that I want to make, I think. Uh, but for, for sound production, yes, I'm using it all the time, all the time. Yeah, as you can see, the, the way I create samples, it, there's a lot of labor involved. There's no automatic uh, workflows there. It's just going to create a lot of variations and then edit them one by one. Lots of labor, but it's all worth it because you're going to create... Uh, a, a library of sounds that is unique to what you want to create and yeah I'm gonna put it down here somewhere um, what do you call it sample production sample and don't forget to to use high quality samples hi if you feel like you can't create high enough quality samples uh, purchase some uh, or download some I'm gonna actually put down Lego Velt here because he, this is a good reminder for me that, well, while I think I could do some sounds that are unique to what I want to create, uh, there are other people that are much more skilled than me and, uh, and go have a look, scout the internet. Yeah, so that's a, a good reminder there. Yeah, I'm gonna sample with the analog heat. Doosh. Sample production, yeah, that is basically sampling. Yeah, and this was like a good reminder. This, that should be green. Like, turns out I didn't have a green. I'm gonna use this Lego belt. Thank you. Good reminder. Thanks. Of talent that is not myself. <laughs> okay, the pocket operators. These, I think, all of them, all of the, of the pocket operators are beat makers. This is a sampler. This is a synth drum machine and they're pretty good. Uh, I think the the knockout, the sampler, is, uh, you know, since you can sample, you can put any kind of sound you want in there, and it sounds great. You can even put these sounds in there if you want to sample them. It's just to sample, you know? Uh, yeah, so let's have a look at this. So will I bring it to to the show? Yeah, I think so. I think what's cool with something like this is, uh, as I told you, you can get away from the gear a bit and uh, hold something really powerful and interactive in, in your hand and you can be in total control. So the thing, the thing with this pocket operator, the whole series, but in particular, the the last three of them, they're much more useful, I'd say, than the earlier ones, where the earlier ones suggest the style and uh, 
there is no getting around that sound and style that the earlier polka dot operators were created with. Uh, these, the last three, uh, or in particular these two, the tonic and the knockout, they don't try to decide for you what kind of style you want to to create music with. They're very open-ended. Um, like this is a sampler, so you can sample whatever sounds you want there, and you can. These are one shots, and these are kits. So it's basically a a whole sample that has been sliced up to play different parts of the sample. Like if we go down here to this, for instance. Like a straight kit, this. Another kit, this. These are uh, presets. And if I go down here, this is something I made. And it's polyphonic. So I think, I think it's actually 16 voices. Is it? I, I'm not sure, but I think so. I think every channel can play simultaneously, if I'm not mistaken. And um, they've done it like this. You can preview a sound and you find it. Okay, this is the one. And then you go into the right mode and you start doing uh, sequencing that last sound that you pressed. And then. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna try the effects. Copy that really quickly into this is really really fun to play with and if if you're creating the kits and the sounds carefully and recording them uh, with a, a real plan in your in mind you can create something that sounds much more uh, sound rich than one would expect when when you see something like this I mean, already you can hear like this is yeah. I think it's really cool. And the other one here, the tonic, is um, really beefy uh, drum machine. So it sounds. It, depending on what sound pack you ha have in it. Yeah, yeah. I think these two especially is something that I'm thinking about. In some way or another, maybe have a few a, f a few moments in there. Another thing that I've been thinking about is to sequence this and also be able to play it live. And to do that. I need to have an input from a keyboard and an input from the sequencer. So I need some sort of uh, solution there. And we've got one solution here, a MIDI solution from MIDI Solutions. It's a Quadra Merge. I've never used it. I bought it today, actually. Uh, so, let's see. These are MIDI Solutions. They make some really great boxes for, for MIDI uh, any MIDI need that you might have, uh, they they have some really neat solutions for that. So this is um, four inputs and two outputs. So you you can input a lot of MIDI 
and it's gonna out merge all of this and uh, send it out into two different uh, identical signals. So what, what I was thinking here is to have the dig attack going into here and this keyboard going into here. And this way I could probably um, play this with the keyboard and also sequence it with uh, the dig attack. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah, so now it's merging whatever comes in here and sends it out in here, uh, out there. So both of these are going in here, essentially. Okay, so let's see here. Yeah, yeah, so it's working. Let's try another routing. So I'm gonna try this now. Because what I was thinking was that because we have a, a nice keyboard here. With nice velocity settings. I can use the velocity to program this, which is nice. And then I can use it to live play this, which is nice. Is it being doubled? It should, it, technically it might be doubling, but I'm thinking about bringing a smaller keyboard like this. Uh, sometimes you wanna do this, you know, you wanna play something bigger than what this, it's just how much, like one and a, almost three, um, octaves here, one, two, yeah, two and a half octaves here. So, uh, this is something, by the way, that I find really uh, <laughs> cool. When you start using a sample instrument, uh, you don't necessarily have a reference key. So, I was making this without knowing what key it was, and now it's kind of... Uh, okay, yeah, in... E flat, cool. Yeah, I'm gonna play an E flat. That's great. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, rewrite that um, um, track nine there. I'm gonna. Okay.
beauty. Stuff like this is what I want to be doing live. It takes a lot of rehearsal and I need to be like, concentrating a lot on the keys. Uh, but yeah, this this inspires me. This is making me smile inside, but because I'm <laughs> concentrating, uh, that smile might not transfer outside uh, all of the times because it, you know, I, often see videos of myself and I see myself sort of frowning, like, yeah, yeah, I'm very serious. But inside I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is really cool. Yeah, yeah. Stuff like that is what I want to do. Stuff like that. Well, this has been a, a, an honor to speak to you and everyone. Um, as you can hear, I'm losing it slowly. Uh, focus is pouring out. Uh, I have a sip of this oolong tea and say something nice. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure how to summarize this. I think I've been shooting for four hours or something. Uh, got completely lost in there. Um, yeah, yeah. Samplers and beat makers. I, I, I feel like I, I didn't speak too much specifically about beats, but I think everything is beats, basically. Rhythm. Yeah, yeah. So I think it comes down to um, how do I get the beats that I want? How do I want the sounds that I want? And the workflow there. Uh, I didn't really pre-produce like any music now. Pre-produce some sounds just to show the, the, the workflow that I'm working with. But I think in some cases, maybe I even uh, make some recordings in, in Logic Pro and I half arrange something and I feel like, yeah, this, this is something, especially when I'm dealing with vocals or something like that. And also, if I want to get stuff in from the Analog 4, for instance, I, I probably half produce it on the Analog 4 and then I think, yeah, this, if I want to bring this into the Octa, uh, sorry, the Dig Attack, uh, I probably need to do some creative, uh, creative, 
sampling. And also I think I could easily sample a whole range of sounds, uh, of tones, as I did on the Octatrack with slicing. You can do that on the Digitact as well, but just not with any keyboard slicing, but you can still parameter lock it. Uh, it would be super cool if Electron made a, a slicing yeah, slicing on the dig attack as well. That would be super cool. Uh, but at least you can do it in the sequencer. So that is that is really useful. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm a bit uh, cuckoo <laughs> right now. Uh, so I think I'll just summarize this by saying thank you for watching. And thank you for all the cool feedback you've given me. Uh, and I'm going to keep keep making several of this like the next episode i'm probably gonna know what stuff to use and i'm gonna have like a clear idea of of the final setup but as you could tell in the end here this openness that i'm speaking about is not necessarily a, a blank sheet and, and everything can be done uh, an openness for me is is more something that like what I was doing with a keyboard, uh, to play with a keyboard, suddenly you can go into any direction. You can mute tonal stuff that is on the sequencer and take the tonal harmonics to another place for a moment and then come back and then switch it on again. That is uh, an openness that I really dig. As you can see, I, I think I was smiling inside, but perhaps I was also smiling outside. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, anyhow, um, gonna make more episodes leading up to the gig and probably afterwards as well because the setup that I'm creating for this particular gig is probably something that will grow uh, and change over time. Uh, and uh, there is always gonna be, uh, you know, new gear that solves things differently and then I have to ask myself the same questions again how do I want to perform live yeah well thank you so much for watching and if you enjoy what I do here on YouTube and if you think this is helpful in any way or if you find it just interesting uh, feel free to support me over at Patreon my Patreon site is open for everyone uh, you can Support me with as little as you want, uh, as much as you want. Uh, it's the monthly donation thing. You can opt in and opt out uh, the way you want it. And uh, you also get access to downloads that I create sometimes, sound packs and patches and stuff. Uh, if you just want to buy my patches here and there, uh, uh, you could go to my web store, store.truecuckoo.com. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm putting up more and more patches over there and uh, I, I'm actually thinking about reaching out a bit uh, into other synthesizers because I, I see a lot of really popular synths out there and I bet that many of them are just being played with presets, like factory presets and some of them might not be like all that cool and interesting so I, I want to take a look at some popular synths as well in the future uh, and see if there's something I could do to, to make it more interesting to myself. Like I know that I have a, a MicroKorg Excel, I think I have somewhere. I'm not sure, Some somebody's borrowed it, I think. It would be super cool to make a custom pack for that in the future. And that could be uh, accessible on the on, on my download store and for my patrons as well of course yeah yeah looking into the future here sorry about that but it is getting late so thank you so much for watching and peace out everyone stay curious and hit me up on social media and uh, yeah follow me here and there peace out see you soon